Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Nag Vladimirsky, the LIAF Festival Director, and uh, you have just been watching International Competition Programme number three, uh, which is called Playing With Emotion. Um, and um, this is the live stream. It's our second live stream of the festival. We have three filmmakers whose films have just been screening and uh, our three guests are Anita Killy from Norway, whose film was Mother Didn't Know. We have uh, Emily Ann Hoffman, whose film Blackheads was the first film in the program. She's here from uh, the USA. And we also have Rory Wardby Tolly, whose film was the last one in the program. It's a film called Power Wash, I Love You. And we're also joined by my co-director, Malcolm Turner. He has uh, jumped in from Melbourne, Australia to be with us. Greetings. So um, I'll just start with a general question uh, for all of the filmmakers. You can uh, each take it in turn, whoever wants to go first. They're all remarkable films, all of your films in very different ways. Um, so I, just a general question. I just um, am curious where your ideas uh, for these films came from. So uh, who would like to volunteer to uh, go first? Anyone? <laughs> Shall I pick you, Rory? I will. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think, well, this film, I've, uh, I sort of approached it quite differently to previous films where usually I'd start with an idea and then write the idea and make the film but this was sort of started as more of a writing exercise where I didn't really know where it was going um so I just had that first line of uh dialogue which is like uh, what are you looking at and it just became this conversation that sort of kind of like free writing I guess and quite quickly and these characters just sort of developed out of that so I always knew that you wouldn't sort of see who they were until Originally, you weren't ever going to see the characters, and then, um, yeah, it, when I was developing the visuals, it sort of they get revealed through the flashbacks and stuff. But um, it just sort of turned into this argument between this couple, really. So it kind of wrote itself in a way. I mean, I don't know. It was did quite. You know, did you know how it was going to end when you first started it, or did you just start making it and then, without not having, without knowing what the ending would be. Yeah, I don't really know anything about it. It was, it was, I was, I wasn't sure I was even going to be a film. I just sort of started writing this back and forth and then it kind of, yeah. So there was no like stage directions in the script and I didn't storyboard the film and it, I made it very much like kind of intuitively just drawing sort of shapes and in, straight into After Effects and moving them around, uh, which is really nice because, you know, I worked on other films um, quite recently before, which were a lot more stressful and had more of a normal production, I suppose, where, you know, um, all these different stages and all these deadlines and um, a lot more collaboration, which is obviously really great and enjoyable, but also it was quite nice to do something with zero pressure, actually. Was it um, made very quickly? Yeah, I guess so. Like the, the process of animation, I, I've sort of set myself all these constraints to make it um, yeah, quicker. So the way the, the way it's animated is using shape layers and just sort of tweening things. And um, I mean, there's a bit of code in there that keeps the like line width consistent, so it looks more like a a drawing, I suppose, when things kind of get closer and further away. But uh, yeah, it was just it just was easy to move stuff around. So I made it maybe in a, a few months, just in like. Well, I just didn't have a job at the time, so I just sort of <laughs> needed something to fill that gap, I guess. But, um, yeah, it was really fun to make, which isn't always the case. So that was good. Did you intend it to, because um, I know it's been, you put it out on the on the internet. Did, did you always intend to just put it out there on the internet rather than maybe keep it away from that to, you know, so... I mean, we're obviously, we've screened it at our festivals. I know it's screened at other festivals, but sometimes having your film out there on the internet does limit those yeah. um, 
possibilities. It does. I do feel it limits it less now than it used to. So it's kind of like a trade-off between I've just made this thing, uh, how quickly do I want lots of people to watch it? And, and yeah, like you say, some festivals won't screen it. But also I'm like, I know a lot of festivals like Lee Earth and other ones that I like don't necessarily have that restriction. So yeah. I sort of, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. The whole film is a bit experimental. Just chuck it out and see what happens. There's not really any risk, so I don't know. Okay, Anita, how about yourself? Where did the um, where did the idea, the general idea for your film, come from? Yeah, uh, I made a film, Angry Man, that was about uh, violence in at homes many years ago, and um, and I felt that to make another film that can be used to start to talk a difficult subject was something that I really wanted to. Do. And since I am a farmer, and since we have these very special uh, rooms, this is a silo where it used to be high for animals. And now they are empty because they're making these plastic balls that is all around on the fields. Mm -hmm. And these are the most dangerous places in the farms. They are 10, deep, 10 meters deep. And, uh, and down here, it used to be dead birds, dead squirrels, mouses, and those animals that cannot get up. So it becomes um, a symbol when you're very far down, but also uh, psychedelic when you're very far down. And, um, and we, I, I visited a neighbor that has this silo, and, uh, and when I look at the, the wall, because this is a picture from down there with a dead bird, and you can see the wall looks like a forest. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Very much to start to, to look at the uh, Swedish artist, um, Jun Bauer, who has been dead now for 100 years, and then the creatures that was in his film start come out of the walls. So that is how it started, actually. And um, yeah, so uh, but we also wanted me and uh, Marianne Wunder Gornilsen, that, that is the other writer. We also wanted to try to make a film without words to see if we managed to, um, to tell, to go into her um, totally frustration. And um, and also because we wanted to have this shape and this form, so that is also I mean just try to do things as difficult as possible for us <laughs> <laughs> to see if we could come along with it. And um, and uh, yes, so now it is a film that's a bit unclear, I guess. A lot of people wants to get the answer, but well, I wouldn't call it unclear um i mean i'm curious to know whether you consider it a children's film or an adult's film or for both or and how it's been received um has it screened at children's in children's sections of festivals at all that the first festival it was screened on was a film for children and then uh and then got the first prize there but it was only three grown up in the jury that has seen it so 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 it was not children so the only children actually that have seen it was uh, my son and his class 14 mm, children about 12 years old and uh, and they were most they they liked most that it looks real and i'm not so sure if that's important because i work with quite clever people that makes it looks more real that I'm used to. Mm. Uh, so so it is interesting that that is what they like very much. And uh, and because of she's cutting off her hair, they were very nervous. Of course, they wanted her hair to grow up again, but it also shows that that is so important with the really young people. Mm. And for me, to cut the hair if you are very depressed is very, um, not dangerous so that is a nice way to show that you really need some help if 
if that can help someone to see that you need some help. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I mean, it can obviously be seen on, on many levels, your film. Yes. Um, I mean, broadly speaking, would you say it's a film about childhood depression? Yes. yes. And um, I don't know if I many can see it, but in the beginning, it is this uh, knife with the cork from a wine. That uh, so, so I think if you have some problems as a child, you can see it if you recognize it. If you don't see it, you see other things. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, I, I made a film, Angry Man, many years ago, and for example, that was quite spooky for someone, the grown-ups, not for the children, because if they, if they was not in a violent family, they start to wondering who is the owner of that dog. And I mean, they look at other things. And that is something that I like if I can manage that in my films that you have exactly what you say, many levels. So yeah. if you can, as you are as a child, you can look at one thing. And if you are in another stage of your life, you look at something else. And for example, we, during when we made the film, it was uh, farmers here that watched the film and and it's a lot of farmers that is very lonely and is depressed because it is harder and harder to be a farmer. And for mm -hmm. example, going around there and make this sound, then someone was hardly start to cry because they felt uh, so related to the feeling. So, um, so I mean, people see different things. So it sure. is interesting to see if it can be a starter because that is what I want mm. to talk about difficult feelings and uh, we don't know why she is so depressed that she maybe don't want to live any longer but um, but if I start to talk with children about that hopefully they can put the thing they are most afraid of into her and then they're to start to talk about because it's another person not their personal problems yeah so that was uh, the um, our thought about to make it in that way. Okay. Emily, um, tell us a bit about your film. So, yeah, where did where did the um, original idea for your film come from? Yeah, um, a couple of years ago, I was in a long distance relationship, and we were lying in bed one night, and I he had blackheads in, on his skin, and I remember thinking. I remember asking him if I could pop them, but also thinking at the same time that I was like, I must really love you because I don't like doing this. Like, this is gross to me, but I don't think it's gross to do it to you. Um, and, you know, then we had this whole conversation about how that's bad and you're not supposed to pick at your skin. And then the next day he left to go back to his home. And I remember I started picking at my skin as kind of this like petty, like, you left, you're not here anymore. So I'm going to pick at my own zits now. Um, and I just thought that was so, it was kind of this like silly, interesting exchange. Um, and so I wrote a little short story about it. And then in 2019, um, this production company slash like uh, anthology short film series called The Eye Slicer approached me and commissioned me to make a film. And so I just was kind of going through old things that I had written and that one had stuck with me. So I just like expanded it then to be a little bit, bit about like um, these self-destructive habits that we have and um, how we put those on other people and how when those people leave us, how we put them back on ourselves. And um, that's kind of how it evolved. And it's, I mean, it's quite an unusual um, mix of techniques. Um, I mean, you've got obviously got stop motion in there and. 2D and 3D and you know a lot of compositing I was interested um I mean you've made stop motion films before but um what is it about stop motion do you feel that did you feel stop motion really lended itself to this particular film yeah I think well one I just enjoy stop motion because I enjoy working with my hands and that tactile quality but also the stories that I'm typically drawn to are these kind of like intimate pre-human stories um, and so I like stop motion because it's so visceral 
and I like this quality of uh, you know you can see the artist's hand um, when when someone's doing stop motion and so and especially this story was about the body you know it's it's a very visceral subject and so I wanted that you know tactile quality to it um, but I also think why I prefer that over live action, which people have asked me before, like, why don't I just make these things with real people is that I think it's the perfect in-between where it provides a layer of separation that kind of disarms audiences a little bit because you see stop motion, you think it's cute or interesting. And so I think um, it, it allows audiences to connect with the characters in a different way because they're puppets and because it's miniatures and not real actors. Where did, where did you get the voice for the psychiatrist from? Like, how, how did that person turn up? Because it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's sort of equal measure, pitch perfect and cliche all at the same time. Like, it's a really kind of like, it just, that, that voice is exactly what that voice ought to be. You know, it's such a, it's such a kind of a totemic type of voice for it. Where did you find that person? Yeah, Robin Brenner. She was great. I just found her on a um, backstage, you know, the casting website. We, yeah. I, the main character who is, is played by Chet Siegel, who I've worked with a number of times, but then the other two voice actors we just posted for. And I wanted someone, my, both my parents are from Long Island and they have pretty heavy accents and my whole family has that Long Island accent and I have this affinity for it. And I think it like comes with this attitude of, you know, like no bullshit, we're getting down to it. Like, come on, talk to me, what's going on? And there's like, you know, the positive end of that. And then this character obviously was a bit more negative, but um, yeah, so I, she had that accent. She was, she was great. And what, what ended up being weird is that I cast her and then later found out she went to high school with my dad. So what? wow. Small That's world. So <laughs> but yeah. the, some of the little, some of the little kind of just weird left of center stuff like you know where did you come up with the idea of, for example that she'd be administering advice while drag racing you know she, um like, that's such I a think, quirky kind of one-off thing to think yeah um i think i had done some phone some therapy before where i had phone sessions instead of in person and um i had had a bad experience with a therapist you know who was giving me terrible advice and I remember hearing in her car one time and that just like added to this annoyance that I was feeling towards her where I was like, what you, like you're, I can tell you're a terrible driver. Like there's cars honking in the background and all this <laughs> stuff. And so I was just like, you know, uh, expanding on that idea that this, this woman is not paying attention. It was just, you know, all over the place. And, and then the main character is she's running away with her imagination as like yeah. another escapist route of, you know, she's she's very annoyed with this therapist, but she's also kind of like using that as a scapegoat, yeah. as something else to complain about at the moment instead of focusing on her own problems. It's a, it's a great voice, and Rory, the, the 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 issue of voice is an obvious one in your film as well. And what you know, I'm really like it. it it's, Phil um, Phil Malloy, for example, sometimes has used those kind of machine type voices in some of his films, and it's it works incredibly well in your yeah. film was was that was that a given like was did you have that that voice that tone that style in your head when you're making the film and where, where did you actually how did you actually put that voice together or those voices together so i started well again it was because i was trying to make something quite quickly and cheaply and more fun and i knew i could find actors with that as a whole process and it you know obviously completely changes the writing so I sort of wanted to just check first how it worked using like a text text to speech generator and um they're really good now that's the thing like yeah, some of them yeah. sound quite realistic but that makes it more uncanny because it's mm. you know it used to be they sound like weird robots which would have a very different tone whereas now it sounds like a weird person um, you can mm. find quite specific ac uh, accents and stuff so yeah, it was it was quite fun, and then I mean that, that added to the process of then actually directing the voices and having to sort of spell things incorrectly to get them to say with the right tone and adding sort of spaces. So it's still a lot of chopping things up and you know getting them to interrupt each other. It was all done in the edit and stuff. So it was kind of quite fun actually to make it sound more human, like in a way, but still wrong. I don't know. Yeah. 
But I think because mm -hmm. I sort of approach the visuals in a similar way that everything is kind of digital, but a bit wonky. So it sort of made sense, I think. Yeah, right. So the, the other thing about sound that I, that I, that struck me that was common to all of your films and, but, but I'll direct it to Anita first is that all of your films don't really have much of a, um, a, a reliance on music. There's not a lot of music in all of the films and, and uh, Anita, yours in particular, yours, yours didn't really have, I mean, there's a couple of brief words, spoken words in your film, but, but it's, I really admired, um, your ability to tell the kind of story and create the kind of atmosphere that you created without resorting to, you know, the kind of music that some of those films would, would often have. And, um, all of you, I'll get to, I'll, you know, be interested in all of your thoughts about the, the, the use or lack thereof of music in your film, but Anita, in, in the first instance, I'm really interested in why yes, actually, you didn't deploy as much music as some other filmmakers would have. Actually, I was, um, I, I dreamt about to, to use Signe of Kreisner to make the music, uh, the quite the famous Polish composer, mm. uh, made for the red, blue and white in the 80, 90s. Um, and uh, he made five pieces and uh, they were quite similar. So actually I took out one piece when the girl cut her hair off mm. um, and that was a very nice piece, but it made this scene less strong. Uh, so I felt that uh, it was terrible to take it out because it was the longest piece. And I paid a lot for it. <laughs> yeah. And um, mm -hmm. but to, to just to trust that, um, to try to trust it. But I was very unsure if I should do it. So it's, it is uh, more quiet than I was actually planned it to be. Mm. Mm. I, I, I salute your instincts. I think, you know, it's. <laughs> goodness knows what what that caused with your relationship with the the the, the musician and the composer but it's a, a great choice i think in your your film's all the more powerful for it um but but the 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 the, the other two of you to take your pick um just interesting why you know you may have chosen not to really include music very much yeah i think um I, I knew the moment that I wanted music, which was um, when she kind of has that fantasy sequence where the her and her ex are like planets and then they come out of being planets and hug and then it goes to this memory. And I knew that I wanted that to be this like elegant orchestral swell. Um, and for me, that felt like a lot of music because kind of from there on out it's scored, um, but and I, I do think I tend to err on the side of like, like I love beautiful grand scores like that, but I think they are more powerful when used sparingly. So that whole intro, I don't know, it just didn't feel right to, to lean on score um, to emphasize any of the jokes or what was being discussed. And then I, so then I wanted it to be this noticeable moment that everything was kind of coming together and then the drama of like that last sequence where there's really no dialogue and she's popping that zit. Um, but yeah, I've worked with this uh, composer, Daniel McCormick, who I've worked with on my other films and he's very talented. And we ended up doing a Kickstarter to raise some money for Post. And that was a big thing that I wanted to make sure that I had enough money for score so that he could work with additional musicians as well. And it wasn't all just like, you know, digital or him doing it on his own. So. I was very excited about the, the addition of other musicians and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I'd say sort of similar thing where it's sort of the lack of music kind of grounds the film in reality, I guess, and also makes it more intimate between those characters. Um, so you hear music when they go to the flashback to the party and they're dancing, and then it kind of pulls away and there's another kind of I guess it's music, sort of just tones that kind mm. of, and they're still dancing, but then that abruptly cuts back to just the sound of the dishes and the kitchen and the kind of dullness of their relationship. So I think, um, 
Yeah, I, I, I see like music as just sort of part of the sound design and they kind of work together to, um, I don't know, to create whatever you're trying to do and move between reality and the more abstract parts of the film, I suppose, if that's... Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, some, sometimes you watch an animated short that's got music the whole way through and you're like, oh, this would be so much better if there was a bit of just space or silence or, I don't know, time to be surprised it. how often that's exactly what I feel. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was uh, curious I, um, what all three of you are, um, if you're working on anything now or next. Um, I know Anita... You, I mean, it's taken, is it 10 years between films, between uh, Angry Man and uh, this new one? But, um, so, and I mean, Anita, you're, you're, I presume you're like an incredible perfectionist <laughs> and uh, you do take a long time between films. But have you, do you have other projects in mind? Are you working on anything new now or are you just having a break from it? I was actually start to work um, in the feature film and um, this film is in a way a, a part of that. Ah. It becomes a part of it because we wrote it into a, a feature film um, project but then I get cancer so I was sick for many years. So that is one of the reasons. <laughs> um, but um, yes, I am now for Angry Man. I did six years doing that film and that, then I did mostly everything myself. So this time we were four people doing it mostly. So then we used this one and a half year. <laughs> so it's very fast. <laughs> uh, um, but um, yes. Uh, we, I am trying not to use, do research on another film um, about siblings um, uh, incest, so it's not a very, it's quite hard stuff. So your, your films all, um, I mean, they've always, they have ch children in them. Um, is that a specific interest or a specific decision? Yes. Because I remember first time I was in Annecy as a student, when I saw it, all the films, uh, among maybe 200 films in the program, what it was, it was maybe five that I could see was um, made for children. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my head, it is so many beautiful films for grown ups, and, and too many films for children is, uh, is uh, I mean, I really want them to have some, some, something to tell as well, not only to share up children, uh, because uh, I think it is uh, just amazing um, form to go into these difficult uh, yeah. and Yeah, then, it, uh, it, it, it really is. But the, the, the problem, I, I really love that approach, Nita. It's, it's, Sorry, I didn't mean to jump in on this one, but it is something that's really close to my heart. The problem, and I'm not sure if, I think Nag sort of roughly agrees with me. We've had these conversations before, but yeah, the problem that I strike in running or curating a festival is not curating great and intelligent films for kids because kids get it. You know, it's the parents that just will look at some of the films that we would love to show. They'd just be like, why are you showing my child that? And they don't, they don't understand it. And it's, it's, it's almost like we have to educate the parents before we can get a lot of these really good films in front of, in front of kids. But, uh, but that is why the, um, in Norway, we show quite much film at schools and then yeah. the parents cannot decide. And of course, uh, my films is, uh, I made them so children can see it, but there are, um, I think, more, more grown ups actually are seeing it, and they are very used in prison or in other places where mm -hmm. they still start to talk. Because uh, uh, very often the children, they are, they are so locked. So maybe if they are small enough in the children's garden, they can start to say that, oh, this is happening for me, to me at home. Mm -hmm. But mostly it is grown ups, the teachers saying, yes, this happened to me. 
So, but I think anyway, it is important because if they don't say anything, they learn yeah. about things yeah. and they keep it in mind. And that's also important, I think. But I know, uh, for example, Angry Man, it was in so many cupcakes, mummies, that don't want their children to see the film because they want it. They really want that they beautiful small girls to believe that it's a pink word out there. <laughs> yes, you can probably see Nag and I just like I know. It's just a, yeah. it's just a <laughs> reflex. Like we we yeah. both just stood in foes and being <laughs> beaten by. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. oh. We've definitely been there. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, Emily, tell us about what you um, are you working on anything now? New at the moment. Um, well, just freelance jobs here and there, but also um, I've been working on developing a TV series. I really want to make a stop motion series for adults. Um, and uh, the main character is a comic artist in that. So it'll be kind of like, she'll be writing about her life and we'll go into these 2D animated sequences. Um, and as I've been working on that, I've just gotten really more into comics and the indie comic scene myself. And so that's been really fun is just making my own like small comics in between working on this larger project that will hopefully exist in some way someday, a long time from now. <laughs> oh. Okay. How about you, Rory? What are you working on? Um, doing a lot of writing for little shorts and ideas stuff i'd like to make uh i've i've worked on some um short doc, sort of documentary films with a, an american director called kurt sensenbrenner so that it's about um pku this disease so he's kind of overseeing it and I'm sort of directing the animation so that's kind of like a, a bigger kind of series of short films but um what else yeah writing i wrote a pilot for a sort of comedy sci-fi drama thing might probably won't go anywhere but it's, I'm just trying to like I don't know I've got lots of ideas and I want to try and make I, I want to make something more like power watch again really something quick so I don't have to I don't know yeah I want to try and make yeah, more short things maybe I don't know yeah just just building on that um just you know Rory you're in the UK and Eta you're um in a very remote part of Norway, as far as I can tell. And Emily, I know you're in a really, really beautiful part of New York State, but heading back to New York City. So in each of your places, in each of your homes, what's what's the the environment, the funding environment, for example, like for each of you separately for making your own personal films? Not so much about the kind of commissioned and commercial jobs that you might be able to get, but in terms of making your own films, like what are, how are you feeling about where you're each individually at. Maybe start with you, Rory, since you're on the left-hand side of my screen. Um, well, the, the BFI had a big uh, funding for animation last last year, I think. So they just announced a whole bunch of like with like proper budgets, like the mm. olden days. So I feel like things are better than they were maybe like ten years ago. And I know this BFI network supports sort of smaller projects, but it's a lot more geared to live action. Um, yeah. Other than that, I don't really know, to be honest. I don't, it depends, like little schemes pop up from time to time, I think. But yeah. It's tricky. Yeah. Anita, in Norway, what's the, what's the funding and, and support structure like in Norway? When here, most of the money has been here because I have been <laughs> producing milk. Right. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so now I am actually rebuilding three levels on farms into a big animation studio so that I can also invite other animators that wants to work with multiplan or puppet film so that that can also be a living for me. Yep. Because there are many houses here so they can come and live and do everything. But, uh, but it's also, um, we have the local funding that can give actually a, a starter and then a development. And then we can ask the Norwegian Film Institute for money. And of course, it's a art contest. But, uh, yeah. but um, so 
So that is, well, we can't make, I can't make these films if I don't get this money from Norwegian Film Institute. And, other. and also, since it's a subject that is good also for schools and so on, we can also ask for money other places. So that is, of course, a good, good reason to continue with that because, um, yeah. yeah. Okay. And Emily, if you're, if you're not Bill Plimpton, how do you go about um, making an independent film? in the united states well i think i'm gonna move into anita's barn is what i'm gonna do for my next (laughs) film i'm inviting myself over that sounds amazing um it's really hard the united states yeah doesn't have a ton of funding for especially for short films um i think it's a lot of just private uh investors like i've met people um in in the film festival circuit who will give like you know, small donations for a producer credit, or um, there are some grants, they're like pretty competitive though. Um, For me, the saving grace has been this program called Creative Culture, which is uh, from the Jacob Burns Film Center, which is based in Westchester, New York. And there are a couple programs like that, that I know of across the country um, that are, they'll give you like a small grant to start but then they'll also give you space equipment stuff like yeah, that as yeah. well as mentorship um yeah. you know people who could help you work on uh the film so for me i i had a fellowship with them i think in early 2017 and i've kind of just like stuck around <laughs> they yeah. haven't been able to kick me out yet because they're just yeah. very supportive <laughs> and um i continue to use their resources and then also for this last film, we did Kickstarter. Crowdfunding's a big thing yeah. Um, yeah. because it's really hard to, we don't have BFI or um, what's the Canadian, the and NFB, no. we don't have those amazing resources, unfortunately. So yeah. we just ask other people for money. <laughs> <laughs> the fellowships are great though. They had, they're still painting over the fingernail marks that that I left on the door when they dragged me out of the last place. The <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. So. No, they're great. So, and I'm very grateful how, for those. People. How about New York state though? Like New York state's often, or my impression of New York state is it's, you know, f- forget the feds and what they're doing, but New York state's sometimes been supportive yeah, of the in a way that the feds aren't stuff there is yeah. stuff in it and you can look into you know like every nonprofit organization like i think tribeca films has a pretty big grant um yeah. specifically for women filmmakers yeah. i think bam has stuff sometimes um and there there are definitely grants it's just that that whole process is a lot of work unto itself and then they're pretty competitive because yeah. a lot of people are looking into it so if you have time, it's it's nice to apply to those. But a lot of times also maybe you're trying to make things for a deadline and and the grant process in itself is several months. So oh, yeah. I I did I did peer assessment on one of the BAM program one of the BAM grant programs and it was an mm-hmm. avalanche. It was just a tsunami of Right. Anyway. I'm sure you could speak to that. Well, I'm lucky. I just, I, I'm, 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 I wasn't going to say this, but now I've started. I will. I, um, a film I'm producing over here just got funding about two weeks ago. So I was like, yes. Congratulations. Yeah. And I, and I, I gave it no chance either. So, like, you know, it's the exact kind of mindset you, you want your producer to have. Oh, no chance of getting this funded. Yeah. yeah so. <laughs> Great filmmaker there. Yeah. Okay. We're going to have to wind it up now. Um, so thank you to, uh, all our guests, um, Emily, Anita, and Rory. Um, for all of you that are listening to this, they, they, you've all got your own websites, haven't you, with um, examples of your work and your past work and bits and bobs about yourselves on there. So if you want to find out more, just go to the, these wonderful filmmakers' websites and uh, you can see other examples of their past work as well. Um, thank you all for... Um, being part of this thank you for listening to this um we will be back with another live stream tomorrow night uh, with some more filmmakers and in fact for the duration of the festival we've got one at least one live stream every night so please um tune into that thank you as well to malcolm as well for being part of this and uh thank you all for coming see you bye thank you bye Thank you.